Welcome to What the Truck. I'm Dooner here with Michael Vincent, the dude. Welcome, brother. Hey, beautiful day here in Freight Alley. It is sunny outside, still a little cool, but how you doing, my friend? Hey, is the thin white dune Duke once sang, Is there life on Mars? Whoa, boy, that perseverance landing yesterday. My house was ecstatic. I was, you know, I canceled a meeting or two to watch it. I apologize to those of you that I did it to. <laughs> and one thing that's really cool is the name for this came from an essay with over, uh, there was over 10,000 people who sent in essays. Alex Mather was one of them of Lake Braddock School in Burke, Virginia. He wrote in his winning essay that, uh, that named the rover, this is a quote from him. We are a species of explorers and we will meet many setbacks on the way to Mars. However, we can persevere. We, not as a nation, but as humans, will not give up. Did you watch the Perseverance landing yesterday? I did, man. And it was a big deal in my house as well, my friend. I mean, what, for, for myself, really, and, and, you know, Mather's essay was absolutely inspirational actually and i, I can't I, it's no 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 wonder that he won in a perfect name for it uh, but my daughters you know talking to them and them watching them realize exactly what was happening was 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 pretty awesome right they're six and eight so and they're not really into uh space that much they're more into dolls and stuff like that right but awesome absolutely hey we got a lot of people in the comments too the dude was worried yes uh well he's not worried anymore he's got me back so we're gonna come at it you know perseverance is a what's really cool about this is it's the first rover that's up there that has a sample catching system to mars so you've seen those really cool moon rocks right well this thing is up there it's going to pick up some samples they're going to get back to earth we will find out from nasa today how they plan on on doing that because i believe the rover for the rover itself that is it's uh it's forever home. Also, as a live streamer, as a over the network streaming company, I was really impressed by what NASA had done with their live stream. They did a great job of explaining the science behind what was happening at a level that, you know, my my six year old could understand up to uh, to anybody. I think they do a great job with it. They really do. They make it really good for the lay person and for people to get uh, uh into it and energized and understand what's going on, right? I mean, if you get too technical about it, it kind of uh, scares people off. And they do a great job all the way around. I don't know if you visited, uh, what is it, spaceplace.nasa.gov for kids. It, it's awesome. Uh, oh. I, I, I found it yesterday and been introducing my daughters to it. And it starts talking about it and it's got cool little cartoons and stuff like that. It's awesome. Yeah, no, it's it's fair. You know, I was so into it last night that immediately afterwards I put on The Martian and then I watched uh, Total Recall. Get your ass to Mars. Such a fantastic, such a fantastic movie. I've got Mars fever. Everyone in my house does. Um, here's a little aside from you. We mentioned David Bowie earlier. This is just a little movie trivia, right? You know the okay. movie Cliff? I do. Yes. So John Lithgow's part in that movie was originally written for David Bowie. Did you know that? I had no idea, but they they picked the right guy. I'm a huge Bowie fan, but Lithgow's yeah. killer. I love I love Lithgow. Kill a Third. few people, they call you a murderer. Kill a million, <laughs> you're a conqueror. Best line yeah. in the movie. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. I liked his I liked his his role on Third Rock uh, a, a lot as well. <laughs> he was, he's awesome. Yeah. Well, today on the show we've got NASA on the show. We got we've got Kennedy Space Center. We've got two great amazing guests from there. We've got NASA Jet Propulsion's laboratory over in Pasadena. We're talking to the gentleman who made the parachute that you saw on that lander, who 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 did all the des the design for that, and the wind tunnel testing, and yeah. all of that. So fascinating stuff. If if that didn't work, we wouldn't even probably be talking to NASA today because they'd be busy cleaning up the pieces. So so awesome to see that Perseverance landed, and we got to find what the big plans are for that. One thing we did miss out on though is we could have gone to Mars, and so could all of you. Uh, what do they send up there? 10, 10.9 million people put their names on a uh, on a silicon chip that was sent up with this Perseverance rover. So 10.9 million of you are up on Mars. We are not one of those people, though. Uh, no, but there, I mean, 10.9 million and Michael Vincent is a fairly common name, actually, if you Google it. So I'm, I, I might be up there. I mean, at least my name might be up there. I could claim it's me in, in a few years. Nobody would remember. At the very least, there's a Michael and a Vincent. Well, let's tip the band. Yeah. Let's get to it. A lot of content today. This episode is brought to you. By Legend Transportation, which has been establishing partnerships through outstanding customer service since 2007. Learn more at newlegendinc.com. Little headline for you before we get down to business over here. California DMV warns of, guess what? Another ransomware attack. And this time it's on an address verification contractor. That's right. Clarissa Haas reports the California DMV is warning customers that a vendor it uses to verify personal, personal and com commercial vehicle registration addresses was targeted by a ransomware attack in early February. 
The DMV issued a statement on Wednesday cautioning customers about the data breach involving a Seattle-based contractor, Automatic Funds Transfer uh, Services. It has used uh, them since 2019 to cross-reference addresses with the U.S. Postal System's national database for vehicle renewal notices. Yeah, so Jason uh, Feldman, compliance officer at AFTS, uh, or the Automatic uh, Funds Transfer Services, confirmed the attack uh, to freight waves, stating that the company's compromised network was taken offline within hours of discovering the breach, and the company also notified law enforcement agencies which are looking into attack, he said. Uh, he told Freightways on Thursday that he wasn't aware the DMV had already customer, had alerted customers to the ransomware attack uh, at AFTS, though. Yeah, and Feldman, he told Freightways, he told us here, we immediately took the compromised network offline and we've hired a new company to build us a brand new network from the ground up. They've hired a forensic IT team too that is looking at the uh, their old compromised network to investigate the scope and nature of the breach. However, they've done what we're finding out what's happening a lot of times in these ransomware attacks now. He said he couldn't comment on the group behind the attack and he won't say how much the hackers requested or if they paid that ransom. So... Not really sure what happened there, but man, IT security every week, this seems to become more and more of a prescient issue. Another big issue is all these ships at anchor, Hatbag Lloyd CEO, uh, he just did, he had a virtual event in Germany. He was talking about COVID congestion and container shortage forming the perfect storm. That's right. All eyes have been on California San Pedro Bay. You guys even talked about that on Midday Market Update yesterday. Hatback Lloyd has focused on the congestion crisis at the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach during that virtual press conference. And their CEO, Rolf Haben Jansen, he said this, today there is fairly extreme port congestion. Um, San Pedro Bay with representing the number of ships. We have a picture of this too. And if you look at it, it's just crazy. Uh, just yesterday, there was what? 62 ships that were out at anchor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no kidding. And it's un uh, unprecedented demand for the imports of COVID-19 outbreaks uh, um, uh, among uh, uh, the longshoremen, right? Like 800 or something like that, they were saying, are, are out of the 15,000, which is actually fairly significant. And schedule reliability admittedly is at a very low level. Jansen said the delays that we are have at arrival have really, really gone up. Hapag Lloyd says that the average delay is grown from 43 hours to about 125 hours. Uh, and, and, you, and, you know, um, you know, Sakura said five, what is it uh, now, five days at anchor waiting to get in or eight days at anchor trying to get in and then five days in terminal, the, the container. So, uh, yeah, huge delays, my friend. Yeah, he said if you take into account the 125 hours, which is more or less five days, then you can see that it's quite tough for a lot of the ships to then be back on time at origin to take on the next voyage. So the issue is now starting to compound. This is no longer just an issue at Port of Los Angeles and Long Beach. It's causing trouble with ships not being able to return on time, empty containers not being able to return on time, but there's already a shortage of those. Equipment is getting tougher and tougher to come by. Um, we do have a chance to talk to a guest from XBO, though, right? It's Jake Schnell, Vice President of Client Solutions at XBO. I'm sure they've uh, they've heard a little bit about what's going on in the West Coast. Um, Jake, thanks for joining us on the air today. Hey, thanks for having me, fellas. Really appreciate the time uh, to talk about all the great things that are happening at XBO. And shout out to both of you for the space wardrobe uh, to celebrate that uh, that Mars landing by the Perseverance yesterday. Uh, oh, and, and, and as you guys as you guys said. Um, I've been with XPO since 2012, and it was one of the first 20 people hired at the company. I've had wow. several different positions during our hyper growth, and I have what I consider the best role leading our sales initiatives for our freight brokerage division. And we offer our customers the best options in terms of level of service, variety of solutions, and capacity. We listen to our customers' supply chain challenges, and we're able to use those capabilities to create some great ways to solve those challenges. If you're a shipper and you're looking for size, scale, and technology, we should be talking. We deliver capacity and service our customers need. So you know, Jake, you're 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 the head of sales for one of the the biggest brokers out there, right? And we always love to hear what's going on in the marketplace. Tell us what you're hearing from your customers. Yeah, absolutely. I'm constantly talking with our customers, and in 2020, and even the beginning of 2021, with all these weather delays and everything that's happening at the ports. It's really critical that we listen to our customers' needs. And what we've heard as core themes were flexibility, visibility, and creative ways to ensure capacity. So we developed solutions that allowed our customers to be successful. My three favorites have been our guaranteed capacity, 
which is through dedicated lanes with our own carriers or leveraging some of our assets in other divisions. That gives us access to lots of capacity, guys. Our real-time pricing, which leverages our robust pricing algorithms to stay ahead of market shifts and deploying that pricing through technology such as APIs. In fact, our API quotes increased by about 45% last quarter. And lastly, and one of our customers' favorites is our Flex Fleet program. Customers receive the flexibility of shipping anywhere with the peace of mind that they own the capacity with leased trailers. We've used this with customers such as a leading technology retailer to provide trailers during their peak season with the flexibility to go anywhere based on consumer demand. All of these creative solutions are possible because we have the best people in the industry supported by world-class technology. Wow, well, sure sounds like it. Um, XPO is a technology leader. You've kind of hinted towards that. What We've heard about XPO Connect. What differentiates it from what else is out there? Yeah, absolutely. And we are, we are a technology leader. That's right. And XPO Connect reflects our commitment to help customers through technology. It's our digital freight marketplace where carriers and shippers can manage every part of a transportation order. And we have lots of expertise with carriers and shippers, especially in adjusting to unpredictable environments and changing demand, which is a lot of what we're seeing today. Connect provides our customers with real-time visibility into freight status, up-to-the-minute delivery tracking, and suggestions for more cost-effective and faster transport. Across brokerage, almost 90% of our orders have at least one automated piece of the transaction. And here's the takeaway, guys. That's what customers want. It saves time for all of us. That's awesome stuff. It's really fantastic. So clearly technology is a, differentiate, a differentiator. Sorry about that. But what else uh, sets your brokerage team apart from others? Yeah, so we provide solutions to the largest shippers in the world. And we do business with over half the Fortune 500 today. If you're looking for that size, scale, and capacity, we can help you deliver to your goals. We're thinking strategically about what our customers will need next and how do we best support them. An example of this is our decision to hire and enable people with that technology at the bottom of the market last year. As demand rebounded and the environment became tight, we were in a strong position to help our customers procure capacity. This is why we're known as one of the most agile brokerages in North America. And again, like I said before, all of this is possible because we have the best people in the industry supported by that world-class technology. And last, we're one of the reasons why we were just named world's most admired company for 2021 by Fortune Magazine. And we've been on that list since 2018. We're really proud of that, guys. Wow, well, we were just looking at this video that was playing too, a program that, that uh, the application looks pretty, pretty cool. Uh, thanks for joining us. We appreciate your team. Is there anything else you'd like to share? Yeah, I appreciate the opportunity, fellas, to give more insight into XBO's brokerage business unit. I'd like to personally thank all of our great customers for trusting us with their business. I also want to give a shout out to my team for all they do every day to enable our success and to all of our employees throughout our brokerage network. Thank you for continuing to drive our results while being safe during this pandemic. To learn more, shippers can go to full-truckload.xpo.com or connect.xpo.com. Thanks again for having me, gentlemen. Thanks for, thank you for coming on. Uh, it was a good time. We appreciate it. Now it's time to get to the main event, though. We're having NASA come on here. We're going to be talking about this awesome rover landing. You know, I can't wait. I've been waiting with bated breath. But we got a video. We got an appetizer video to play right now. It's going to show you what went down. If you missed it yesterday, roll the tape. Nothing can be taken for granted when you get to Mars. There's a lot of things we just don't know. Space always has a way of throwing us curveballs and surprising us. I mean, until we get the data that says we're on the ground safely, I'm going to be worried that we're not going to make it.
Wow. Whoa. Wow, that was that was a wild video. I was watching this. I was so excited. Right now we have with us, it's Chuck Duvall. He's the program deputy manager, launch services program over at NASA Kennedy Space Center, as well as Omar Omar Biaz. He's a senior launch director over at NASA Kennedy Space Center as well. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us on the air. You guys must be over the moon today. Thanks for having us. Did that really happen? <laughs> yeah, we've got to pinch ourselves sometimes to believe it, it happened. It's It's unbelievable. So, hey, Chuck, you, Chuck, how did you get on on Mars to take that footage of it coming down? <laughs> <laughs> it was, I, uh, you, know, uh, you know, we're uh, we're primarily responsible for launch, but I was so nervous yesterday, maybe because, you know, it was out of our control at that point. But uh, I was more nervous yesterday than I was on launch day, which sounds crazy, but. It was it was an amazing day for for yeah. NASA and the, and the world really. Well, I remember on the live stream about forty five minutes before it lands, suddenly they have they have uh, some some guy from your team come on. And he's like, now this is the like the moment of danger, and he's starting setting the table that something may go wrong, and then all of a sudden you're like, wait, something could go wrong here. I thought I was going to perfectly. He started listing all the things that you know could go wrong. I'm like, don't do that. <laughs> he's gonna yeah, exactly. but we. We all have to deal with that. I don't know if you saw the head of the uh, science uh, community rip up the contingency plans in the uh, uh, post-landing uh, press conference, and we're all happy when we can burn them or tear them up. Well, gentlemen, let's talk about your roles in making this happen. Uh, Chuck, how about you? Start with you. What What's your role in all of this? Because uh, you did mention the launch portion. I think you had a you're a big fixture of that, correct? Yeah, uh, I mean, I'm part of a program of close to 500 people. I'm the deputy of the program, the Launch Services Program. And we like to call ourselves the uh, smart buyer uh, or a matchmaker. Uh, a spacecraft organization will, will come to us and say, just like yesterday, uh, we've got a 2,000 pound rover. We want to go to Mars in the middle of summer of uh, 2020 and land in February. Um, here's our requirements and here's how much money we have, what do you got for us? And we have a stable of launch vehicles on contract and we choose what uh, is the best ride for our spacecraft partner. And then we are with them the entire launch campaign. We, we help launch, uh, launch them. Uh, in this particular case, uh, United Launch Alliance was, was the chosen one. Um, they've been a, a big part of uh, all of our missions to Mars uh, to date. Um, and uh, we launched, and, and once the uh, vehicle separates and we know that we've all done our part, uh, we, we become spectators at, at that point. And I'll turn it over to Omar because on launch day, there's, uh, he's one of the most important people in the program. Sure, Chuck. So, so yeah, Chuck mentioned that, and, and going with the flavor of your show here, um, you see there's some logistical items that go along with it. Uh, part of my job on a day-to-day -day basis is, is managing the manifest of all these missions going uh, into space for the launch services program. And we have a, 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 a big portion of NASA's manifest, all the unmanned missions, and we do some of the um, uh, advisement to the um, um, human missions that are using the same kind of rockets that, that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. But my role does change uh, about two to three months out where I become, um, my primary focus is the launch campaign, making sure all those steps are taken to accommodate that spacecraft, uh, which, which was weighing uh, 2,200 pounds um, to put on a vehicle much like this, only it's 200 foot long and, oh. um, and it gets it from zero to about 19,000 miles an hour in a couple of minutes. So it's uh, quite the uh, ride for it. We, we got to make sure that um, at the end of the day that everything sticks together as far as a spacecraft. You know, these are very lightweight spacecraft. Um, they're not built very ruggedly. So this has to provide a really nice ride to the uh, vehicle. Now, I have something to show you here. Let me dip down. It's been stubbing my toes and so forth. Just to give you... <laughs> some size. Um, these are one of the three hold down bolts. This is made wow. out of steel. This holds this whole stack that's over a million pounds on the ground. And then we have an explosive nut that 
releases all three of these bolts right at the moment of liftoff uh, and lets that rocket fly. So wow. this is this is one of the, uh, it's just amazing, 300,000 pound proof load on this and it just breaks through the uh, threads on there. That I'm is talking about the origin of a trophy. Yeah, talk about a conversation piece. People come out, oh, this is a bolt to a rocket that goes to Mars. No big deal. Yeah. <laughs> that, I think it's amazing that, what did you say, three of them hold that rocket in place? Three of them hold that rocket in place. Uh, yeah. That is unbelievable. So, oh, Omar, when you, you uh, talk about the rocket selection. You were talking about the specifics of it's. it's got to provide that power, but it's got to be a really nice, smooth ride, man. You've got to have that nice luxury car ride for that fragile rocket that's taken off, and it's going through some rugged times getting through the atmosphere, I would imagine. So can you talk to that a little bit? How is that uh, rocket selection done? So, so you have – the first thing is what what is the payload and what is its size and weight? And where is it going? And uh, once you do that, you're narrowing down some of the field. Uh, obviously, you can't put it on one of our smaller rockets. Um, there's another factor with Mars 2020 in that it um, had a, a, a nuclear uh, heating generator source. So it's also got to be a proven uh, vehicle with uh, data books that go back quite a number of years on studying every possible scenario that could happen in case the flight didn't go good. We have a nuclear source on board. We don't want to hurt people. So, so there's a lot of steps beyond just size, thrust. Um, a, a lot has to do with its history and certification. And, um, and, and then we put it to, to the market. Um, we have a great competitive market now um, with, uh, with ULA and SpaceX and even Blue Origins uh, coming online here in a couple of years. Uh, Northrop Grumman also is in the mix. So uh, to us, it's just like like a freight broker. You know, it's it's mm -hmm. best price or best accommodations for us. It's the same way uh, trucking would do it, except we we do it less off less often. Now you mentioned those nuclear those nuclear isotopes. Now I was watching The Martian last night. I've seen it multiple times, but I'm watching it last night. And in his rover to keep warm, he puts he digs up that nuclear isotope and puts it behind him. And my question to you guys: How realistic is that movie as a representation of Mars and what a potential space station would eventually look like there? I uh, will provide zero on that for you because I didn't see it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> have you seen that one? It, it's been a while, but my when, when I watched it, my recollection was, I mean, it, there was a lot of validity to it. Um, I think just like anything else, the speed in which he accom accomplished things, you know, were, was probably the most inaccurate. You know, it, mm. it, would, it would take, and uh, you know, a much longer time period to do the things he was doing. But by and large, I, uh, I think the science and space community kind of rallied around that uh, that movie. Yeah, that's what I've heard too as well, Chuck. And uh, uh, Mark Weiss uh, confirmed that once as well. He thought it was fairly accurate. But so, but the 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 uh, but the 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 tarp that he put over top of it when he took off from Mars. How realistic is, was that? Was that the crazy part? Really? Like, eh, no. I don't remember that part. Okay. Sorry. All right. <laughs> I got a better question. For you. How about how about so? Tell us a little bit about that launch. Take us there. So this this rocket's going up. You've done all this preparation. You pick the commercial partners. You have the rocket, and then uh, then you're there. What, what was this May 2020 that this took off? It, uh, it took July. off in July of 2020. Yeah. So um, yeah. we the, the spacecraft arrived in January, and then we get hit with COVID um, here at the space center. So things had to change drastically. We're not going to our offices anymore. We're, we're sitting in a, in, in, in our homes, um, working off of, uh, virtual services and, st and so forth and trying to keep the team safe. We finally found an approach to be able to get our teams in there, um, safely and spaced out and with the, you know, the right, um, protective gear, um, to be able to do this. But along the way, we did run into um, some technical issues with, with putting the, the, the rocket um, together. And also um, some of our folks either uh, got sick or there was the fear that there was contact with, with a lot of the uh, uh, their other coworkers. So we had to quarantine. And so it was, uh, it was real dicey um, in making this, this short um, 
a 20 some odd day launch window. And we, we lost quite a few days, 13 days of the initial um, window due to, to some, some technical items and also uh, some of our folks being quarantined or being sick and so forth. Uh, just so to just give imagine, you uh, sorry, well, just to imagine how hard how hard it is to, to get to Mars, where you know fifty percent of the entire history has not made it well. So, and then you complicate that on the ground uh, to try to do it within a, a pandemic. I mean, that's just uh, a lot to ask a team, you know, to pull off. But uh, this extended team certainly did that. As you can imagine, we've got people with, uh, you know. Um, skills that don't exist anywhere else in the world that we were relying on whether they were going to be lifting the spacecraft uh, onto the vehicle or, or um, some other operation where we needed the team that was uh, trained for that and had no no backups so how do you do that within a pandemic so the big challenge was keeping everybody safe to to accommodate that and like Omar said Hey, you've got to do it in a in a three week window, or you you push it out twenty six months. Hey guys, we have a student question for you. We have a kindergartner here who has a question about Mars. Would you mind answering it? Hold on a second. Okay. Let's have it. Yeah. Let's go. Will I be able to go to Mars by the time I'm my dad's age? <laughs> <laughs> He's got What's some time to go. Is, uh, when you said it, I'm like, oh, there's the future of Mars right there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe she can answer the tarp uh, question you had earlier. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was yeah. Um, he, yeah. He's a big fan. He wants to get up into Mars. <laughs> Another part of this mission, I don't know if you, uh, you had to have seen it yesterday, just the, uh, the amount of interest that it sparked um, ar around the world, but also, you know, in uh, grade school children and stuff like that. I mean, that's, uh, it's always like that, and I think it was even magnified uh, because of you know what's going on in the world and, and how hard things are. So it was uh, it was great to see, and this the interest of the next generation is um, you know is really fabulous, and and they're going to be the ones to really you know take this to the next step. We're just kind of paving the way for them. We're you know the pioneers, but they're going to really take it to the next level. Awesome. Hey, uh, Omar, I got a question for you from uh, my six-year-old, uh, uh, May. She would like to ask you a question. Go ahead. Sure. Um, do you think you'll find aliens on Mars? Do, do I think we will? I, I hope so. That would be so cool, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so, and, and answering the other question, yeah, I, I hope we're able to, to get somebody to, to Mars uh, when your daddy's, uh, uh, when your daddy's age, uh, but just to give you some some idea, um, this mission um, is going to to cache a couple of samples of soils and, and rock and so forth to to be able to have a Mars sample return mission. That won't occur until the early 30s, um, uh, 2030s. So, it, just to give you a time frame, stepping stones on getting there. Now, money funding would solve a lot of issues if if this were a primary focus of our uh, country, the world, um, sure, we could we could get people on Mars pretty pretty quick. But there's other uh, things that are uh, more important on those that hit list that these countries need to do, and and we're just uh, we do it, you know, spoonful by spoonful. Well, hey, we appreciate your time. Congratulations so much to you and the team over there at Kennedy Space Center. We're going to jump over to Jet Propulsion's lab over in in Pasadena now. But I want to thank you one more time for your for your time today, and thank you for being gracious enough to answer our kids' question, my son and Michael Vincent's daughter. You bet. You bet. Thanks for Thanks, guys. Take care. Thanks for having Thanks, us. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Now, Michael, you know something. So you're seeing yeah. the, the logos that they have, those, those Mars 2020 logos, and I, I don't know if you noticed on the live stream, but um, I reached out to, to Mark Weiss about this because I saw some peanuts, right? Some peanuts about around all these launch stations, and they had that Mars sticker on it. So my question was, wait, do you guys have Mars-branded peanuts? But it turns out that it might have just been like TV magic like we do, where you just put a sticker over. Uh. over all <laughs> so it might have just been some planters, which is uh, which is exciting. You know, I like how NASA was like those two guys were a little bit like 
for guys that go over the moon, go go over to Mars, they were they're pretty down to earth in their expectations. You know, they weren't like, yes, you will be traveling to space to our kids and we're going to find some aliens. They're just like, yeah, we hope so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. They're like, wouldn't that be cool? <laughs> and it would be very cool if they, if they find them up there. I, I agree with them there. But yeah, I, I mean, and that's something that has really struck with me. And I know it has stuck with you as well since meeting Mark, uh, what, about a year ago, right, is is really their ability to connect with everybody and, and hey, really keep it down to earth. Hey, check out this picture of this this parachute that our next guest has too. And if you saw the lander, uh, I mean, it was they were showing mostly simulation, obviously, of, of it coming down. But this giant parachute, he's doing, he, this Gregorio Villar, he's doing this in the, I believe it's the world's largest wind tunnel. So let's bring him up on air so he can tell us all about this. It's Gregorio Villar. He's entry, descent, and landing operations lead. If you're into NASA Lango, that, that is E-D-L at... Um, Ocean Laboratory, and if you're into NASA lingo even more, that place is also called JPL, as I learned from um, a few of the fine folks at NASA. Hey, man, how's it going? Congratulations on making that thing land safely. Thank you so much, man. What the truck is this thing? That's such a cool name of our show. So thanks for having me on here. <laughs> well, who is it? You know, did, did you ever have any concern? I was talking to our previous oh. guest about... About 45 minutes before it landed, there's someone who comes on a live stream and he's saying he starts talking about everything that could go wrong. It was like he was setting expectations and, you, you know, you start getting nervous. And I think that the teams were because on the live stream, you could see you guys like there was like this relief, but also jubilation when it finally landed. Yeah, that's a great point. And this isn't. This is actually my second time doing this. I was part of the Curiosity Curiosity team back in 2012. And at that time, I only had one or two years of experience. So this was much more meaningful to me and I was much more invested. And I understand now why people celebrated the way they did on Curiosities because they literally spent eight to 10 years of their life just working so hard, making sacrifices with like their friends and family and to have it all right on this crazy thing called EDL and see it succeed. It's just like a bottling up of emotions that get released when you find out that it actually worked. And I still can't believe it worked because it's just so crazy. Oh, come on, Gregorio. You were like, when that guy was talking about the things that could happen, you were like, it may have 99 problems, but the parachute ain't one of them, right? <laughs> That's so funny. I was, I was, I like that line. I was going to use that for some stuff. <laughs> How do you know the parachute's going to work? You, you have the, so somehow you have the world's largest wind tunnel. Right. Uh, I'm not sure what that entails, but you got to make a parachute. You got the wi the wind tunnel. What kind of testing do you do? And is it just like is it just doing the math to figure it all out? Oh, it's funny you bring up the parachute because funny enough, that was one of our bigger concerns at the beginning of the project. Because parachute, believe it or not, they're not. It's not an exact science. It's more. It's kind of an art as well. And between the Curiosity rover and Perseverance, there was another project called LDSD for all you um, acronym fans. It's Low Density Supersonic Decelerator, or as it was advertised, like the NASA UFO project. But basically, what happened was they were launching, they were testing parachutes over Hawaii, and over one of the parachute testing, it kind of it failed. And now we were just like, do we not understand parachutes? And so that's kind of a huge debate on the Perseverance project early on. And there was a lot of big high level reviews and eventually people said, go do a lot more testing and a lot more analysis. So we tested our materials and we eventually built a stronger parachute, which we had to go through, which we had to test through that wind tunnel. Um, that took about like a year worth of effort to plan. And then a few, two months to like put together the, the hardware and one about two weeks to test it in the wind tunnel. But even cooler is we tested those parachutes on a rocket afterwards. It's called a sounding rocket. So we put the parachutes on these rockets and we launched them into the Earth's atmosphere. And you can actually see these um, if you go to the JPL YouTube page. We have a parachute that got launched into the, into the atmosphere of Earth and we deployed these parachutes supersonically. And so it was just a, a, an immense amount of analysis and testing in all regards, and even just like material testing. So if you just take the cloth that the parachute's made of, we would do things like stretch it out and put loads on it. So there was no shortage of doing our due diligence for making sure these parachute, this parachute was going to be ready for Mars. Mark, I mean, uh, uh, Mike, what did you ask the what did you ask the last guest about the tarp in uh, in yeah. the Martian? It would actually work if you could take off with that? Yeah, with right. that. <laughs> you must have seen the Martian, right? Yeah, it's funny. I always bring this up because I've seen that movie probably ten times. Yeah, I, I got the audiobook. I bought it on it on you know online, and I actually got to see a pre-screening when it was 
before it was edited. So like they still had the, the cables as if they were floating through space. But yeah, I mean, that concept is, uh, I mean, I don't, I don't know the exact numbers, but I, I can see it working. But the idea is that the atmosphere on Mars is much thinner. So you need, mm -hmm. you know, less support for those type of things. So, I mean, what they were saying is, there, is theoretically correct. I just don't know the exact number because, you know, Hollywood, sometimes they embellish things just to oh, make yeah. it you know, more exciting. And that's, that's all cool with me. I love it when Hollywood does that. You mean is Hollywood very... embellishes things? I didn't. I didn't realize that. <laughs> it's kind of a very NASA thing, though. Like in the movie, like one thing they keep doing, like they replace a lot of the action in that movie with just problem solving, and they do an amazing job of it. But it's always yeah. like, do the math, work through the problem. Is that a very sort of NASA credo that you all abide by? Yeah, that, that's actually a cool thing. Usually, we account for a lot of time to solve problems, but sometimes they're just the unexpected, right? And it's really, really cool to see the team come together in those scenarios. Like we do these, like whenever we're doing tests with the spacecraft here on Earth, and there's like a little um, problem, and we only have say minutes or hours, everyone just like gets in the zone, and I'm and I, I just nerd out watching people just zoom in, and the same thing is when when spacecraft are in outer space or humans are in space, right? Like Apollo 13, like that that vibe that you see is a tr is a real thing, and it's it's just it's hard to explain how admirable it is to see such competent people working as a team on just and just coming together in just seconds or minutes it, it's really 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 impressive so so gregorio we just talked to chuck and omar and and i feel like it should really be a a, a movie chuck and omar go to go to mars or something like that should be, <laughs> okay. be the title of a movie but it, so they were on the launch part of it with the rockets and and we talked to them about selecting the rockets and and you're on the landing the descent part right. of it with doing this uh, so how does that interact right they 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 talked about how you know it launched and then they have to sit around and, and wait to see if it's successful and then they they celebrate hugely that it happened successfully yesterday you watch it launch and then you've got to sit around and wait right but how do you guys interact before it happens what is there interaction between there for, for between the two teams right i mean this is a huge team effort so we all we always have each other's back right and some of us on the landing team actually flew out to florida to watch it even though we're amongst a uh, pandemic but the launch vehicle is very important because it's the first thing that directs us on our journey right and we actually don't aim towards mars at first because if something goes wrong with the launch vehicle or the rocket, we don't want to send the rocket to Mars. So we <laughs> aim purposely away from Mars. And then throughout our journey, we correct our, our tra trajectory to get closer and closer to Mars. But, you know, we tell them things like how, how fast we want them to kick us off um, after we get off the rocket, where we want them to kick them off the rocket. And they also spin us. So they're like our quarterback, right? When the quarterback throws a football, it puts a spin on it to have more stability. The launch vehicle literally spins us and shoots us off so that we're traveling um, stable through through space. So, I mean, everything's all interconnected and you have to be with missions, like complicated space missions like this. Well, and for you, it's like, okay, I put my, my parachute and the, the landing gear in there and it's taking off in July, but then you got to sit around and wait till till February for your big moment. What are the, so you have to make most, most of your major milestones before that launch happens. What were some of those that you had to hit in order to ensure that this would all go smoothly? Yeah, uh, man, I'm having flashbacks now. I remember after the launch, I posted something on my Instagram where I was sitting um, on the rail, like the train tracks at the launch site. And I remember riding 203 days until we get to Mars. So that, that's bringing me back right now. But you're right, there are a lot of things we had to get done. Uh, more obviously, just have the hardware built and integrated. But another thing that people kind of take is kind of underappreciated is the software. So the whole EDL sequence is automated. The spacecraft does it by itself. And that takes a lot of complicated software and a lot of testing. And so in addition to having the hardware built and the software built and tested, we have to put them together and make sure that the hardware and software together work well. And that's all, and you know, that was kind of a huge thing that we needed to make sure that was ready before the launch period. I imagine. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's amazing stuff. We unfortunately, I mean, we could have done like three hours on this thing. Unfortunately, we're out of time. But before we let you go, how do people learn more information about what you guys do over at JPL? And if they want to get involved, you know, Michael Vince and I were a little annoyed. We didn't get our name on per, with 10.9 million people. Got <laughs> we didn't get. Right. How do we get a mailing list? 
Absolutely. You, you guys can go to mars.nasa.gov and they're pretty good at advertising, you know, stuff like putting your name on Mars, which is a really cool thing. Two or three years ago, we advertised that and millions of people submitted their name and we literally etched them into these small chips that are now on the surface of Mars. That's and awesome. this won't be their first mission there. So make sure you go and put your name on the next mission and you'll be on another planet. But, you know, follow all the social media accounts, NASA, NASA JPL, and just visit the website. Oh, and by the way, there's some really cool videos and footage of EDL coming out in the, ne in the next day or so. So definitely tune in for that because it, they, look, they look amazing. That's awesome. Well, hey, man, I got to give you a little cowbell. Congratulations. I mean, what? what <laughs> we have been born. More cowbell. Nice. <laughs> hey, Gregorio, th yes. thank you so much for doing this. I wanted to ask you one last question before yeah, you go, go off. Are you still there? So uh, Perseverance, it, the name Perseverance, right? It implies that there's issues and you got to persevere. You got to overcome those. Was there any time during this mission when you or the team went home at night going, man, I don't know if we can overcome this problem? I, I think one of the biggest things and maybe kind of an obvious one is the pandemic, right? Yeah. Before, before having the pandemic, people, not just NASA, but we all thought we needed to be together in person to have, make this work. And really, you, you kind of still have to do to like build hardware. But yeah. that was a huge concern for the project when the pandemic was starting. And, and we had to evaluate, will we make it with people, with a lot of our team being remote? And, you know, it's not just technical things. It's just like people dealing with having family at home or children. Um, but we did it. Right. And we got through it as a team. And I think that was a huge challenge that we persevered through. And it's it's such a cliche, but the name is ended up being so fitting. Right. Because yeah. we didn't have that name. before. We had that name before the pandemic. And so it was awesome. Guess, serendipitous. Awesome. Let me back on here. Yeah, we do. Oh, we yes. do. Welcome back. Oh, Turner. Perfect. Sorry about that. Hey, Omar, one more time. Thank, thank you so much. We appreciate your time on the show. Take it easy. Have a great weekend and uh, God bless, man. Thank you guys so much. Have a great day. All right. Thanks, again, we'd like, again, we'd like to thank our partners at Legend Transportation for sponsoring today's episode. Legend partners with strategic customers while providing seamless solutions for its drivers and West Regional's premier freight transportation company. Learn more at newlegendinc.com. Now we have another Omar. It's the Omar Hour. We got Omar Singh. He's the founder and president at Surge Transportation in Washington, D.C. Omar, thanks for coming on the show. Hey guys, good afternoon. How are you? Happy to be here. Oh, you got a lovely little, uh, you got a lovely room you're in there. I'm in house shopping. I need like a, a broadcast studio. I live in an apartment. I don't have enough room here, Omar. I'm so grateful to be on this show, to be with the NASA team. Congratulations, NASA. You got two real-time price brokers and you got two Omars. So what a great <laughs> first <laughs> Well, the, one of the things that I found that's cool in your background, uh, this because this maybe will get some context in introducing you, is that when you were getting your BA at George Mason University, your master's at Georgetown University, you used to actually drive trucks, did you not? Yes, yeah. I came up driving trucks. I took a year off of college before starting. Um, I took a year between high school and college and started moving furniture to save up money for college. And I also was a boxer growing up and um, wanted to take a year off to train and try to go for the 96 Olympics, but kind of life got in the way. And I started moving furniture. And my first boss was an old Global Van Lines truck driver. And he kind of took me under his wing. And so at 18 years old, I was driving straight trucks. At 19, I was driving tractor trailers. And, uh, you know, I didn't stop for a very long time. I'm still in the business, but I was, I owned a trucking company until 2010. But, um, yeah, worked nights and weekends, worked summers. I mean, we worked a lot. We worked moving furniture. Is, it's no joke. I mean, we worked 100 hours a week for sure um, during That's the summer time. That's awesome, Omar. So uh, how does, tell us a little bit more of how does a pugilist uh, become, uh, start uh, Surge and why? So I guess I got into it, uh, you know, trucking was just in my blood. After graduate school, I bought um, this, uh, this truck over here. I got a, I had a, I had a baby already and I bought a custom sleeper with a 180 inch sleeper and um, drove over the road for a couple of years uh, with my son and my wife at the time. And um, it was in my blood, you know, before I knew it, I wanted to just kind of be an English teacher. And uh, all my friends were truck drivers and we were doing well. So it seemed like a good idea to start a trucking company. Uh, I ran that from 2000. I was, I was driving over the road 2000 to 2003, running the company 2003, 2010. And uh, we didn't make it through the recession. So just kind of bled out and had a hard fall. Uh, 
and then got into brokerage. So I was working for some of the national firms, the large national firms, while I was recovering from 2010 to 2016, and then took Surge Independent 2016. Um, and things, we've just been going like gangbusters ever since, really. Uh, I always say 16 to 17 were like the proof of concept years. Like, is this going to work? Are carriers going to take our loads? Are factoring companies going to give us credit? You know, uh, are we going to be able to get commercial office space? Um, and then once we realized things were working and our business model was working, then we kind of really went to market and started sponsoring a lot of the, uh, the events, the industry events. And I started speaking and writing and uh, building a sales team and really just building the company. You know, we have opened up in Chicago uh, this year or 2020 during COVID, which is always interesting to, to hire and open an office during COVID. Um, but yeah, so here we are. I think they're going really well. Well, I read an article on our website and it was talking about spot versus real-time pricing. And I, I think you may have been the author of it. I know a lot of people are familiar with spot pricing, but what is real-time pricing and, and what is the difference between real-time and spot? Well, I think that's great. I mean, I think it's perfect timing because, you know, XBO is on here talking about real-time and a lot of people talk about real-time. But I think for, for shippers and for carriers, you know, it's kind of like, you know, so what's the big deal? So what? You can get prices, you know, right away. But I think there's a few differences that people don't really talk about. They say they can do it, but kind of what's the point, right? And so, because everyone has, not everyone, most people have some form of a spot auction portal where you can get prices that day sort of in real time with a two hour timeout or something. Um, but but the difference between, I would say, spot and real time, there is that spot is by mistake. They didn't mean to not have their loads covered for some reason or another. And real time is by design. So shippers are kind of allocating certain percentage of their volume where they want to play the market or where they want to direct it to their more strategic providers rather than transactional providers, which a lot of times you'll find in spot. Um, and then from the carrier standpoint, you know, they have better control of their pricing, the decisions that they're making, the dates, the lead times, team loads, whatever they build into the logic that works for them to sort of come up with a price right away. So shippers are getting also the ability to put KPIs at the level of the load rather than kind of at the level of the service provider. Because a lot of times in spot, you just have, you have everything from your kind of just barely acceptable service providers to your best, and they're all competing. But you can create a community in kind of real-time API that's a little bit more strategic. Um, so it's a, just a more curated design community and design type of freight. And for the carriers, it's you can just provide better rating. And it's very accessible to people too. I think that's what a lot of people sell it as kind of only, you know, the biggest behemoth companies do it. And it's very accessible to everybody. So the idea behind it, Omar, if I'm not mistaken, is the intentionality behind it gives you the ability to really mitigate that risk from accidental spot pricing, right? If you go into it intentionally knowing that's where you're going to be, you can mitigate some of that fluctuation and, and that last second mistake pricing, or uh, as we say kind of crassly, uh, you know, the dumbest person in the room sets the price type of situation. Is that right? A little bit like that. Yeah. I mean, I think that a lot of the TMSs are programmed to award based on lowest rate, but it's it's neat because with the APIs, you can program it to take into consideration the likelihood that you're going to pick up and deliver on time, right? The likelihood that you're going to accept a tender if it's offered to you. Um, so, you, you know, you have some of that, but yeah, you just take the human error out because, you know, we have bidding teams, obviously, and they go, oh, I didn't realize it was shipping today, or I didn't realize it said it was a team load, or I didn't realize, you know, something else. And so mm -hmm. I made a mistake and you can kind of eliminate that by just programming it and returning rates a lot faster. Omar, why did you make the leap from, uh, the leap to digital, I should say? I think I just recognize where the industry is going, right? As a kind of as a new company, right? Right away when we went live in 2016, it's kind of like how do how how, how can I be relevant in this community? And I mean, our I think my strategies worked since I started brokering in 2011. But then as you kind of look at where the industry is going, kind of 2016 was how do I become relevant? In 2018, like how do you stay relevant? Um, 2019, you know how how am I going to be relevant five years from now? Um, and so luckily, one of our larger customers invited us in 2019 after I spoke at um, one of the industry conferences. He invited us to join their kind of uh, digital provider space, what they call their dynamic routing guide. And so we built the capability of um, 
of returning API rates, right? And it really just was the beginning with that customer of being able to launch with other customers who have on-premise TMSs, but also now we have partnerships with, with Oracle and Mercury Gate, and we're developing partnerships with some of the other very large TMSs that, you know, will I'll go live with that information, you know, in, in kind of in coming weeks. But so any Mercury Gate customer that's interested in real-time pricing with us, we do it any OTN cloud or OTN on-premise customer. Um, so I think it just kind of, it, it happened, right? And a lot of the digital matching we're doing with trucker tools and we're going into automation now with Book It Now features with them and Truck Stop and DAT. So I'm just putting kind of all of our chips into that being the wave of the future. So absolutely. Hey, Omar, you didn't happen to get a, uh, your name on any of those chips that speaking of the future oh, that went up to I, I you? Just learned about them by watching. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're so excited. Well, yeah, I know. We, we found out where we were doing some research for this. We we're like, Hey, wait a second. We we're looking at the fact sheet. We're like 10.9 million. And we didn't even make it on that. There seemed like a pretty good ratio, a good chance, but if people want to learn more and want to talk to you more about what's going on at search transportation, they want to hear more about, the spot versus the real time pricing. I'd love to send them your way. Where should we send them to? Yeah, I mean, I'm super accessible. So of course we have a website, you know, our offices are in Jacksonville and Chicago. And I mean, the easiest thing, info at surgetransportation.com. I'll answer, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm available, you know, and I, I like talking about it and I like seeing people do well. So I'm happy to help people too. Omar, thank you so much. Have a great thank weekend. You, thank you for joining us on this historic episode of What the Truck. We appreciate it. All right, bye. Take it easy. All right. How's it bad news and good news? All right. That time of the week again, Michael yeah, Vincent. Yeah, it sure is. All right. I got some bad news for you. And we got some oh, no. video on this one, too. State Trooper Eric Penrod, right? He was working at Crash yesterday on I-70 in Callaway County when uh, well, he was standing on the left of his patrol vehicle in a speeding tractor trailer that lost control almost ran him over. The almost part of that is the good news, Michael Vincent, because it narrowly missed. But it, you're looking at this video, right? I mean, that that was when you say narrow, you mean narrow. It's, it's sort of like the amount of math NASA is dealing with with these uh, landings and launches. Yeah, that's crazy video right there. I mean, it, it looks like it comes from the far right of where that camera is across and then back across. It looks like that's insane, man. Look at that thing. Woo! Ooh, that's lucky close. man, man. Yeah, lucky, lucky, yeah, very, very lucky man there. I've got some good news for you, man. Yeah. So uh, Global Supply Chain Week starts February 22nd and runs all the way until uh, March 3rd as we bring you the biggest virtual event in freight. You get a prize and you get a prize and you get everybody gets a prize. You could. Uh, well, not everybody, but close. I <laughs> couldn't get an Xbox Series X for Christmas. Ever see FreightWaves TV on an 80 inch eight eight. DTV. Want a robot to vacuum for you, Bruner? You want it? You want one? It is easy for me to say, man. I'm a professional, dude. What? <laughs> uh, what does what, what the truck sound like, like on like AirPods, on dude? AirPods. Yeah. What does it sound like? I've heard what it. What does it sound like? <laughs> I haven't heard it. I haven't heard on AirPods Pro. Well, uh, dude, you're in luck, though. You can now register for a global supply chain week, and you'll be entered to win one of these great prizes, man. Registration is free. You can get out there and do it. But here's the bad news, Dooner. What? You and I are not eligible to win, my friend. Oh. But we get to announce the winners on several days, which is going to be awesome. Every day. There's daily prizes every yeah. single day. There's grand prizes every single day. It's amazing. You're going to see what, what the truck looks like on a 4K HD TV. That Xbox Series X, I don't know if you got it for Christmas or not. I got the PlayStation 5. I can still use a Series X. It's going to be cool. Go to live.freightwaves.com. We're going to catch you there from Monday. We got a what the trucks on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Monday, Wednesday, because it goes that long. It's February 22nd to March 3rd. It's a long event. Then we got other, on Tuesday and Thursday, we got other people filling in and hosting. Gary V is going to be there, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Gary V. I can't wait to see Gary V. Bob Corker. Awesome. Yeah. It's US Center. And there we got Ken Washington from Ford Motor Company, Tom Adrecki, Consumer Brand Association, Rave Desanji from Intel Corp, and a number of special guests. In fact, I have a, a great friend of the show who's been on here a few times. We've done Q&As with not named NASA, that I believe will be on, on Monday. We'll announce that as soon as that's completely Oh, final. Oh, I know who that is. I, I've got the secret. I won't tell, though. Yeah, well, they can take a, they can take a wild guess. Uh, yeah. Here's some bad news. We talked about this before. There's no more Freight Waves radio. So mm -hmm. you listeners who listened on, on the road dog trucking, that's gone. Gone. Last week was the final one. It was a great time joining on there. But here's the good news. Here's the good news. 
Our podcast downloads were way up this week, setting both daily and weekly records. Thank you so much to everyone who made the switch from Road Dog Trucking over to Freightcast, right? You followed the White Rabbit, baby. You followed us down the rabbit hole. We love having you here. You get commercial free, right? Podcast delivered right to your eardrums. You look up Freightcast on your favorite podcast player of choice. You get every single Freightways podcast on one feed. You get this show. You get Navigate B2B that just happened before us. Your Global Supply Chain Week. We just talked about that, so you did. Uh, you're going to get all those events. All, the, all those event sessions will be on demand on Freightcast as well. These things are also available all in their individual feeds. For example, you could look up What the Truck if that's the only podcast you want, and you get that as well, right? It's been a great time. Uh, so It's so awesome. I, I can see why people switch from radio too, right? It seems a little antiquated. I like talking to NASA. I like, the, I like the idea of my voice coming down from a satellite. But you know what? We're starting to deliver internet by satellites now too, Michael Vincent. So we're still doing it that way. Oh, yeah, absolutely they are. You know what I was thinking though, Dooner? What? The 10.9 people that got their names on there. We need to get it. We need to go there like now and get our names done. You don't want to be like on the 10 point. You don't want to be like 9 million. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like when you Google something, if you're not on the first page, I mean, what's the chances of alien life form picking up, uh, you know, Dooner and the dude and, and what the truck, if we're like on 9 millionth. You know, I, I did something similar to this. There was a Coheed and Cambria box set. And if you like pre-ordered it, you could have your name put in the book. And there's like yeah. a few thousand names. I actually found the name that I put my son's name in there. Speaking of sons, my son asked that thing. Like, will he be able to get up to, to Mars by the time he's my age? But how would you feel about your kid getting on a rocket and going to Mars and being just gone? Wow. The potential to come back? Or is, are we talking about uh, like uh, interstellar where it's just forget it? I mean, it's. Even if they came back, right? Isn't it like, I don't know exactly how it took. I don't know how long it taken a human craft in, in the Martian. They were saying it was like four years. I know you can send like a rocket, like that Rover in like, what, like nine months, six, seven months, however long that thing took. Well, we the were people. talking, we, we talked to, who was it? Uh, the ex astronaut who's building the rockets out in space. He's going to build them out in the international space station when they build that thing out and get there in like uh, 30 days or something, 29 days. Yeah. That's a lot closer than Mars though. That's the thing. No, no, he's going to get to Mars in 29 days from those oh, rockets. Oh, yeah, but he has to, yeah, rockets. He has to like, break some space-time continuum technology or something. Yeah, well, I had faith in him. He seemed like a smart guy. Where's the space junk guy? Is he going to send us our space junk shirts? Uh, still I don't know, dude. I, I, that is a cool business, man. I'm a garbage man. Where? In in space. It's going to be a great <laughs> I'm sorry. I was so excited talking to NASA. Today. If you didn't see that launch or anything, there's actually pictures rolling in from that that Perseverance rover. Uh, big time exciting stuff. Sorry for a couple audio issues here. I think I got to switch my output. This this computer I have. I think that one of these USB connectors is uh, dying out. I'll get that fixed up over the weekend, so we're good to go for you guys at Global Supply Chain Week, the biggest virtual event in freight. We will land. We will land on your TV screens on Monday. Subscribe to What the Truck. Look me up on Twitter at Timothy Dune. That's D double O N E R or him at Vincent the Dude. What do you say to send him home? Peace and love, everybody. Peace and love.